Deborah, I'm not sure I like that for my job. All you need to know. All you need to know. I mean, a lot of you know more about a lot of this than I do, uh, looking around the room here. But uh, but no, thank you, and thank you, Letty. Jennifer, it's good to see you. And thanks, everybody, for coming out. And I'm, I'm a North Carolina boy, so I really enjoy that barbecue. Um, <laughs> I understand, let's see, if I, if I do this, is that this? Yes. Uh, I understand this is your first in-person meeting since the outbreak of COVID, and so you, you've chosen quite a topic. You've got a lot of catching up to a lot of things, I guess. Uh, but this is a fine place to begin the, the Russia's assault on Ukraine. What I'm calling the Russo-Ukrainian War, which makes it sound like a war between equal parties, which it's not, of course. Um, the subtitle, Why Should We Care? I don't mean that to be Callous, it's more a reminder that um, we need to be thinking through the consequences and the significance of the war for, um, from all sorts of angles, for ourselves as citizens, uh, for our community, for our region, for our country, really for the world. I uh, only have a few minutes, so I'm gonna cover six reasons. Some of these are gonna be quick, some of these may be self-evident, but there's a sort of for the record. Um, so let me get started. By the way, this is a two, three, three-day-old, three, four-day-old map of, uh, if you don't, those of us who have just open source sources, I really like the Institute for Study of War. It uh, updates the map and its narrative every day, and I, I just find it very useful. So this is from, from them. Uh, so first reason, wow. I just want to remind us maybe of this, because the war's been going on for months, and this was early on, this is what we were hearing about, but it, this, these problems haven't gone away. Um, as with any war, the human impact has been enormous. A uh, number of dimensions, I'll just mention two, as indicated by the, the pictures here. Uh, one on Ukrainian civilians, uh, more than 6,000 killed, uh, 400 of which are, were children, leveled cities, leveled neighborhoods, separated families. Uh, the war has produced an almost unprecedented number of refugees, certainly if you factor in the time. It was a very quick departure of millions of people from the country. Um, even today, an estimated two million Ukrainians are in Poland. Uh, so this, this graphic is the New York Times from the spring. Um, but most of those folks are still there, so hats off to the Poles. Uh, but other neighboring countries have also hosting uh, refugees, and this doesn't include displaced persons who've stayed in Ukraine, moved from east to west, for example. Um, uh, the ongoing terror, also. So this is not, uh, the, you know, just think what what's behind this picture. These are people separated; they don't know when they're going home. I heard on the radio this morning that Zelensky government is urging Ukrainians not to come back to Ukraine for the winter because it's going to be cold. It's going to be cold all over Europe, and it's going to be especially bad in Ukraine. Um, so it's good not to forget this, I think. Um, second graphic I have up here is on food prices. This is an old, out of date uh, graphic. It's from the spring, but I thought it illustrated the point nicely. Um, in this country, we know all about our rate of inflation, which is much higher than we want. Very complicated phenomenon, lots of blame to go around. Some of it, though, is caused by rising global food prices from the war. Um, both Russia and Ukraine are big wheat producers, as you doubtless know. Uh, this is really more of a problem for developed countries, right, who, who really are suffering. An old friend of mine from graduate school was the U.S. ambassador to the World Food Program in Rome a few years back, and I, I'm still in touch with him. He's very, he's very worried about this um, in, the, in the short and medium term, at least. So both, that's just one humanitarian fact, just enormous. Second, also self-evident, I think, goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, energy prices. Russia, of course, is a leading producer of oil and natural gas. The, um, both these graphs, the, the one on the left is, is oil prices, the one on the right is natural gas. Um, both these shot up as, after the war started. There has been volatility in energy markets ever since. Um, the West has imposed heavy economic sanctions on Russia, including, this is especially true of Germany, a, a huge uh, Russia, customer of Russia in natural gas, cut it, has cut its uh, oil and its gas imports 
from Russia. Um, the Biden administration here has tried very hard to lower energy prices, especially prices at the gas pump for U.S. consumers, energy prices for U.S. industry, by, among other things, pressing the Saudis to pump more oil. Uh, that looked like it might work in the summer, but uh, not so much anymore. The Saudis evidently, <coughs> at least in the short term, medium term, think they have more interest in common with Russia uh, than with the West. And so OPEC Plus is, is in fact, going to be cutting production, uh, which will keep gas prices, oil prices, energy prices in general high, help sustain Russia's war, by the way, um, but also uh, keep our economy weak. So uh, the recession that, that, that economists tell us is coming is not by any means caused complete solely by the war, but the war isn't helping. So that's the second reason. Now let me get, uh, move away from the economy, at least uh, be a little, has less directly to do with the economy, and more about, big issues about the United States and its place in the world and what, in particular, can the U.S., is there some probability that the United States would get involved directly in the war? We are, of course, indirectly involved um, in the war. Uh, it's, there's a non-zero, I'm not going to say a high probability, it's a non-zero probability the U.S. could end up in a shooting war uh, with Russia. Um, uh, the U.S., of course, is already involved in the war indirectly since 2014 at least. We and, and NATO in general have been training the Ukrainian army with excellent results, I would point out. Uh, we've supplied billions in material, including precision-guided weapons, such as the HIMARS, high-mobility artillery rocket system pictured on the left. Um, that is, I think, from Afghanistan. I don't know the, the mountain that we think Afghanistan. Uh, but in any case, um, you've heard about this, I assume. Ukrainians are, are, are trained in these, using them to great effect. Uh, along with the British, the U.S. is supplying uh, intelligence, uh, logistical advice to the Ukrainians. Um, so, and the Russians know this, and they're not pleased about it. Uh, the, the Russian propaganda about the war has been stressing in recent months, this war is actually against America. It's, it's, it's Russia's, Russia fighting for its life against big, bad America, um, rather than fighting uh, a war of choice against little little Ukraine. Uh, but what I mean is it, it, we have to think about, as the Biden administration, as the military, as intelligent people think about a lot, I'm sure, uh, is there some chance the United States could end up, not indirectly, but directly involved? Uh, neither country wants that. Russia doesn't want that. Why would Russia want a, a direct war with the United States? The United States doesn't want to fight Russia directly. How would that happen then? Well, uh, wars sometimes uh, break out accidentally, if not, maybe that's a strong word, but despite the intentions of the belligerents. Um, so one path to war, again, low, very low probability, but I don't think it's zero. Under Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, um, any attack on any NATO ally is tantamount to an attack on the United States, uh, that is, every other member of NATO. Um, Ukraine, of course, is not a member of NATO. Russia says that's part of what this war is about, trying to keep Ukraine out of NATO, but a number of Ukraine's neighbors are NATO members. Poland, Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and let's factor in the Black Sea, Turkey, and let's not forget Finland is joining NATO, evidently. It's on the fast track along with Sweden, and look at, look at Finland's border with Russia. It's quite, it's quite long. So the, the the real uh, hazard that some have been thinking about is um, these systems, all, all this back and forth between NATO and Ukraine. It's possible, I don't think likely, but possible that Russia could get, uh, as, as countries often do when they're fighting a war in one country and, and their enemies being supplied from another country, they sometimes are tempted to go after the supply lines or the people supplying the in the other country. So Russia could go after NATO or U.S. assets, say, in Poland, um, and that would force a tough decision on the Biden administration. Um, Russia has lots of reasons not to do that, but things happen in war. When a war goes on and on, and one side becomes more and more desperate, it can do things it would not have thought of doing when the war started. 
the, so an attack like that would put uh, us in uncharted territory. Then another possible route to war is, is, has been discussed a lot more. It's being discussed a lot, kind of off and on. Now we're on a kind of on period. Uh, and that's if Russia used nuclear weapons. So uh, this is where I'm, I think I'm on reason four here. Uh, so this is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, Putin uh, and some of his civilian and military higher-ups have been using provocative language about what Russia might do. It reminds me of the way Nikita Khrushchev would, would sometimes use bombastic language, you know, our rockets will fly, just, just you know, if, if you don't get out of Berlin, our rockets will fly, kind of, that kind of thing. It's, uh, that, Khrushchev never, never did that, but the world was pretty dangerous in October 1962 when he, when he was premier and he put um, missiles in Cuba. So um, Russian military doctrine of, of, uh, includes a principle sometimes called escalate to de-escalate. That is to say, if the war's not going your way, um, it's a conventional war, then uh, consider using nuclear, a nuclear weapon or one or more um, to scare the other side into de-escalating. Um, that sounds uh, paradoxical. I guess it's meant to be. Uh, this is not a guarantee that Russia would ever do it, but they, they considered it. In their military journals, uh, this, this principle appears. Um, so there's been a lot of speculation about Russia perhaps using a, detonating a tactical nuclear weapon, so something in the tens of kilotons, not enough to wipe out the city of Kiev, for example, but a battlefield weapon maybe as a signal. Uh, maybe as a signal from Putin saying, you know, I am a little crazy. I am, I am um, I'm willing to go a lot farther than you are, or than you think I am, that, that kind of thing. There's a lot of speculation about this. Um, I want everybody to know that those, those of us in the, in the academic study of international relations, more, most of us think this is very, very unlikely, uh, but not, a, not a zero probability, but, but pretty low, serious enough that we have to think about it though. And the reason, the reason why it's unlikely is gonna be familiar to those of you who know about nuclear deterrence. Um, there's, uh, although this is a war between Russia and Ukraine, the United States is clearly indirectly involved and cares very deeply about the outcome. And so Putin, if he's thinking about using even a tactical nuclear weapon, you gotta think about the US response. Um, I'll just bracket the Brits and the French, they have nuclear arsenals too. Putin's probably thinking about the United States. And uh, he's got lots of reasons just not to, not to do this, not, not to move the world into this situation we've never been in where one uh, nuclear power is kind of playing around with another nuclear power in this serious way. Uh, nuclear deterrence has worked really well uh, since the Soviets got the bomb in 1949. There have been some close calls. It's not a happy situation, but it does, it does work. Most of us, again, in the academic study of this think, and so we think this is low probability, but um, again, uh, serious enough, the consequences are, are so horrible that we have to think about it. I would add also that um, Russia depends, and I'll say more about this in a minute, Russia is increasingly dependent on China and China doesn't, uh, China and, and another friend of Russia, India, don't want Russia to use nuclear weapons. They don't want Putin to put the world in that new phase. So it, when Putin or Sergei Medvedev or Sergei Shoigu or whoever rattles the saber, the nuclear saber, you know, it's probably to intimidate, it's to intimidate Ukraine, um, you know, uh, to intimidate the West, maybe to divide the West, to, um, there are questions some are asking in this country and in Europe uh, about whether, how, how long are we gonna support Ukraine in this war? It's getting expensive, the winter's coming in Europe, it's gonna get very cold. Um, you know, should the US taxpayers fund this indefinitely? Uh, coming both from the right and the left, interestingly. Um, so it might be that, that, that Putin Putin's aware of all this. This is all, we're a transparent country. Anybody can observe our debates. And so it might be that Putin and his people are thinking, well, I'll, I'll kind of exploit that divide and maybe scare, scare them a bit. Um, that said, a, a desperate leader um, might just roll the dice, right? If, if Putin ends up a few months from now thinking, what have I got to lose? And I'll, I will just say, uh, some, sometimes this keeps me up at night. I think the most, um, 
unsettling thing I know of that Putin has ever said was bef well before the war. I think it was a few years ago. And some of you may know this quote. Um, he was talking about uh, you know, the world. Mm -hmm. America wants a world without Russia. He just does. He wishes America wants Russia to go away. And he goes, when I think about a world without Russia, I'm, I'll paraphrase. He said, uh, I just think such a world is not even worth having. Now, if you an inference, you can draw, infer from that that he would say, "Look, if Russia's going down, we're just bringing we're bringing the world down with us." So, I don't know that he meant that, but it's awfully um, unsettling. So, I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I cannot understand Vladimir Putin, but um, he's not. Let me just say, he's not like you or me in some ways. Um, okay. Broadening the scope a little bit, I've got two more reasons here. How, how are we on time? Are we good. We're okay. Okay. So broadening out a little bit, um, I want to talk for a minute about the effects of the war on uh, what most of us in the academic study of international relations think is the more serious strategic challenge for the United States and Russia. Um, that's China. I've got a couple of things. First, I want to talk about uh, the, the Taiwan issue specifically. The, the, the war might affect the status of Taiwan or the way China thinks about or handles Taiwan. China has, as you know, long regarded Taiwan as a renegade province. Uh, China has never wavered from its threat to attack should Taiwan ever declare independence. I remember in the 1994, I was out at Stanford and heard a Chinese diplomat say this. We will attack, this is a long time ago, we will attack Taiwan if they ever declare independence. And this was already, uh, one of the political parties in Taiwan was already talking about this and the Chinese were trying to put pain to that kind of talk. The United States, of course, has an odd relationship with Taiwan. We, officially, we don't recognize them. We don't have diplomatic relations, ex except we sort of do. We have a pseudo embassy in Washington, or they have a pseudo embassy in Washington. We have the same in Taipei. Um, we have an ambiguous, <laughs> clear yet ambiguous commitment to defend Taiwan. President Biden has been tinkering at the edges of that commitment, trying, maybe being more, more explicit than, say, Tony Blinken wants him to be. I don't know. but. Um, <coughs> In any case, Xi Jinping, you doubtless know, was just surprise, surprise, re-elected head of the Communist Party and president of China at the 20th Party Congress in Beijing. Uh, there is some evidence, and Xi's another character who's very hard to read, some evidence that he's losing patience with Taiwan, with the situation with Taiwan, and wants to reunify with it, um, at least before he leaves office. Now he's got, he's got maybe an unlimited number of terms. I don't know when he's leaving office anymore, but um, he might decide he's in a bit of a hurry. Um, how would he do that? Well, maybe a blockade. China has a, a pretty big navy now. Um, not as good as the U.S. Navy, but more, more ships, actually. Uh, so locally, ha has a lot of capability there um, in the Taiwan Strait, in the South China Sea, uh, to the south of there. Um, China could just out and out attack Taiwan, could invade. Um, and uh, that, of course, would, tough, uh, would force a very tough decision on Biden. Every, every China expert I know in academia says the Chinese do believe the U.S. would, would defend Taiwan. And this is, the, this is the big deterrent, that they really do believe the U.S. would do it, almost 100%. So, um, but in any case, uh, what does that have to do with Ukraine? Well, the, the Chinese are, expert, are really good about studying other countries and their mistakes and their successes. So one, they've been obsessed ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union with how that happened and how they can avoid it. Right? This is a huge, huge topic ongoing in China. And so uh, the Chinese, you can uh, bet, um, you can bet money that they're watching uh, Ukraine, they're watching Russia, Ukraine, they're watching the rest of the, watching the West reaction to Russia's attack on Ukraine, um, and. Uh, you know, the, the Chinese are very good learners. So the good, the good news here is uh, Ukraine has fought back much more robustly than anybody thought, except, except I guess the Ukrainians. Um, I certainly didn't think they would uh, succeed as they have. The Russians clearly didn't think so. Um, and if, if, if I'm in Beijing, the one lesson I learned from this is uh, a country might just fight back harder than you think. And Taiwan does have a lot of 
nationalists or patriots. Um, second, the West is much more solid against Russia than Putin thought. That may not last. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you like. But so far, it's been a very impressive show of Western pro-Ukrainian solidarity to the point um, to the point where again Sweden and Finland are joining NATO. Uh, NATO has deployed more men and material to the um, to its eastern border. Um, Germany has at least promised to raise its military spending to 2% of GDP. I'll believe it when I see it, but that, that's the promise. Um, and, and so on. So that, that and, and the economic sanctions have been really, really severe. Uh, and, and Japan and South Korea are in on the act as well, right? So so this is this is the Chinese have got to notice this. And they may think, well, that's Ukraine, Taiwan's different. Yeah, maybe, but um, but it, it, this 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 has to sober up the Chinese. So but in any case. The connection in the minds of Beijing, uh, Beijing leaders are uh, pretty strong, I think. All right, so the last reason to care about the war, uh, let me just pull out still more, still thinking about China, but looking really globally, the global balance of power, and looking at geopolitics. Um, regardless of how the war ends, the final settlement, when it happens, and so on, that seems a long way off to me. I'm one of the people who thinks this is this is this war is going to go on for a bit longer. Um, Russia's war in Ukraine uh, will probably have the net effect of, of weakening Russia. I mean, you could say Russia has self weakened by fighting this stupidly fighting this lousy war and doubling down and doubling down and doubling down and so on. Um, but Russia is clearly going to be for for a long time. Uh, more, more isolated from the West. It's not going to be able to sell its energy in nearly the volumes to, say, Germany, to Western Europe, as it did before. Um, Germany's, uh, and I keep mentioning Germany, it's Europe's biggest economy. It's the, it's, you know, um, it, if you want to bet the farm on interdependence with Russia, softening up Russia, making Russia a better global citizen, uh, and, and so on. And that, that, that they lost, they lost the bet really badly. This has created a real political crisis in Germany, um, and the rest of Europe is sort of uh, implicated in that as well. Um, so, so Russia cannot can this idea that Russia can be integrated into the West in, in some way, uh, not for a long time. Russia has uh, it needs money. It gets a lot of money from selling oil and gas. And where does it sell it now? Well, China is the obvious. Customer India to a less extent, but China is a huge economy, voracious appetite for for energy. It's only growing. The Chinese economy is slowing. It's got big problems, but it still consumes a lot of energy. And um, and the Chinese think about energy a lot. This Belt and Road Initiative that they have is partly a lot of us think to uh, find other ways to get oil out of the Persian Gulf than going through the Indian Ocean and through the Strait of Malacca. Um, why not bring it through Pakistan into Western? Uh, China. So, so Chinese think about this a lot. Um, so one net effect of this war could be to solidify, to move Putin closer, to, Russia closer to China and further from the United States and the West. And that it, uh, adds to a trend we've already been observing that the U.S. and China seem to be, uh, I'll, I'll say drifting, but somehow moving into something like a Cold War. Uh, not as severe as the U.S. and the Soviets had in the 1950s, but um, but but not the integrated, you know, interdependent dream of the 1990s uh, that the Clinton administration, the Bush, both Bush administrations, father and son, uh, the Obama administration, all had for the U.S. and, and China. Um, China almost certainly didn't want this war. Um, we can infer from the statement that. Putin and Xi made in, at the Beijing Olympics right before the war started. You remember this, uh, friend, our friendship has no limits, friendship of our countries has no limits. Putin and Xi have met three dozen times in 10 years. Um, anyway, uh, we can infer that, that from that statement about friendship having no limits. Um, if Putin told Xi at the Olympics, hey, we're gonna do it, <laughs> we're gonna attack, just so you'll know, we're gonna attack Ukraine. Um, she and Putin probably both thought, well, again, a lot of us thought, okay, if Russia does this, they will win quickly, it, uh, and it'll be over and done with in, in some weeks, and then the world 
will be angry. The, the West will be angry, but the West will move on. As with Crimea, you know, as with Georgia, it's just another move by Russia. They've done these before. They they generally work out. Um, that hasn't worked out right. The, again, the war is still going, and Russia is not doing very well. So China has has to capitalize somehow on this. It's not what they wanted. Um, you you could you could you can see Xi's displeasure at a Shanghai Cooperation Organization summit last month. Um, China was not pleased, and Putin sort of had to admit this. That we, we understand our Chinese friends, um, you know, have questions and challenges about the war. That's uh, I think that's Putin speak for I, I've been taken to the woodshed. Um, but you can you can bet that the Chinese are, are going to try to capitalize it on this. So uh, they're very good at driving a hard bargain. Uh, after uh, after the, the Russians uh, seized Crimea and the West imposed heavy economic sanctions on uh, Russia, Russia turned to China. Russia and China have been talking about an oil and gas deal for a while, and the Chinese wanted a much lower price than the Russians were willing to give. The Russians, after Crimea, came down to pretty close to the Chinese price, and so they cut a deal. So something like that is, is in the works now, I think, and more, more generally, uh, Russia will become more, um, it's a pretty safe bet, Russia's going to be, become and already is becoming more dependent on China. Um, at that 20th Party Congress uh, last week, Xi Jinping did signal, I uh, used uh, phrases like, there's storms ahead for China. There's storms ahead. And uh, colleagues of mine, Brett Womack, Harry Harding, I was just on a Zoom call with those guys this morning, and they're they're parsing um, what Xi Jinping and other high officials said last week. And it's not just the, the storms, it's certain stock phrases that she had been using about peace, peace and cooperation and get, that those have all but disappeared and there are much, many more stock phrases about struggle. There's a struggle ahead. Now what does that mean? It, could, it means in part domestic politics in China, but it, she also refers to China's strategic environment and so on. So it looks like the Chinese are preparing, at least rhetorically and maybe in some other ways, for something like the Cold War in the United States. So my bigger point is this war, uh, whether that happens or not, I, I of course don't know, but I think the world is moving in that direction. I think the war is accelerating that for the reasons I've said. It, it means Russia, uh, Russia is simply not going to be as integrated with the West. The German dream about Russia is over, at least for now. And Russia has to turn to China, and China will say, "Bring it on!" But but you're, we're gonna we're gonna it's gonna cost you. But we know you have no other choice at this point. So, um, okay. So that is all I had. I haven't said anything really about how and when the war might end. I haven't. I've just gestured at the robustness of American support for Ukraine, which which remains strong, but you can see cracks in it politically on Capitol Hill and elsewhere, um, and you see the same in Europe. Um, you know, if you fiddle with some a couple of those parameters, some of the points I made might change a little bit, but I think basically the war still matters uh, for these six reasons and others. I, this is not a comprehensive treatment, but that's those are the six I wanted to to mention. And uh, with that, I'll stop and I've. Love to hear your questions or comments uh, at this point. So thank you. Hey, Professor Adam Trevor yeah. Henry, Elmore County. Really appreciate you being here and sharing. Could, could you talk a minute about some exit strategy options that that you know that you could envision? Get of this ending, ending, in, a, ending, as an ending, ending in a more war. peaceful manner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Exit strategy. How, how would this war end, right? How, because, so, so yeah, just to reinforce the point, it, 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 when that letter by the Progressive Congressional Caucus was circulated uh, earlier this week, that strange letter that was quickly retracted, um, it did talk about negotiation. And, uh, you know, let, let us Americans urge the two sides to negotiate, even though the Russians are at fault, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you read that letter and you think, well, it's, it's easy to say, but the two have, the, the preferences between Ukraine and Russia simply, they don't just not overlap, they're way, they're in different galaxies. I think Ukraine wants all of its territory back. I can't blame them. They want Crimea back, of course. Uh, to say nothing of eastern and southern Ukraine, the parts that are occupied. And the Russians don't want to give that up. The Russians evidently think, uh, 
it, it seems to me they're going to at least try to see if see if uh, see how the winter goes for them, and see if the European solidarity is going to crack when the winter gets cold. Um, maybe even the, maybe you know Congress over here will change, and, and that that also that might work in Russia's favor. Uh, so, and uh, um, so so Putin knows that Ukraine is holding out in large. Not just because Ukrainian valor and prowess, because of the United States supply, right? That's that's clear. He, he knows that well. So, so he's uh, both sides have the preferences that overlap, and uh, both sides think they can end up winning if they just do the right thing. So, so there's really nothing driving them to the negotiating table in any serious way. Putin will say this sometimes. He, he's just trying to trip people. I think he, he doesn't really mean it. And if I were in his position, I might roll the dice too and say, let's keep going and see what happens. How might it end, though? You know, every war eventually ends. Um, the Russian playbook ha has been to see, and they've done this in Moldova, where they, they occupy a strip of Moldova. They uh, have done it in Georgia, where they have recognized two breakaway republics, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And these are, these are what we call frozen conflicts. And so, it might be that Russia would be satisfied with that kind of situation where they would occupy, they would stay where they are, um, or maybe get pushed back a little bit because Ukrainians keep pushing. Um, again, the Ukrainians find that unacceptable. The, but the, the quickest resolution I can see is where neither side, there's no treaty, there's, there's just a sort of frozen conflict where they, the fighting, as happened with Crimea. So, um, when that happens, how I don't know. I think a lot, a lot does depend on the United States. So at some point, um, the Biden administration has to, or, or you know, who ever, maybe this go on until Biden's not president anymore. Um, needs to think think very hard about about this. You know, um, I, I don't think the Biden administration is at all ready to do that, right? Um, but m my point about the frozen conflict is easy for me to see a frozen conflict coming out of this indefinitely than either side getting what it wants, right? You know, when you're messing with a country's sovereign territory as Russia is, if it gives an inch, um, the game's over, right? It can't, it can't give an inch. The Russians know this. So, um, so, so the pattern, Russia's setting this pattern in Moldova and Georgia that I, I think could, could ensue in Ukraine. That's the best I can do, because I, I, otherwise I can't see this thing Ending in any decisive resolution. Yes. Thank you, um, Donna Price, retired Navy, and also with Albemarle County. Okay. Um, no way a supporter of Putin or what's what he's been doing, but has the Western strategy of expanding NATO to the very borders of Russia not contributed to the response as Russia feels its back up against the wall during the Cold War? There was that buffer of Eastern Europe, and in the north you had Sweden and Finland, which were neutral states. Yeah. Now you look at NATO with the expansion of Sweden and Finland, virtually encircling the western and southwestern border of Russia, with the exception of Ukraine and Belarus. So my question basically, has the West, by expanding NATO yeah. into so much of southern and central Europe, contributed toward the Russian response? Yeah, it's a it's a serious thesis. Uh, colleague at U Chicago, John Mearsheimer, has made this really famous. If you, his video has many, many millions of views, make, making making this point. Um, I think that's only part of the the answer, and I, I mean that seriously. I, I think I, I I think it's relevant, but I don't think it's the whole story. And I'll I'll put it. Uh, I'll make a couple of points. One is that. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that Putin really believes NATO would invade Russia. Right, so the, there's, the military threat is not clear at all to me. I mean, we, we know from history, just don't invade Russia. Nobody should ever invade Russia from the West, right? <laughs> Napoleon, Hitler, just never works out, right? Um, uh, and he's got to know that. It's a point of pride for Russians. So what's he, what's he, but he is afraid. So the way I put it is he's afraid for, he says he's afraid for Russia. He's afraid for his regime. And NATO expansion is part of a package of things that generally go together. The two other things are expansion of the European Union and the coming of liberal democracy. 
So there are these so-called color revolutions that started in Serbia in 1999, an old friend of Russia, but uh, Orange Revolution uh, in Ukraine 2003, Rose Revolution in Georgia 2002, uh, I've, and then another in, in 2007, 2008 in Ukraine. So I've looked into Russian reactions to these so-called color, color revolutions. And it's, it's freak out mode in, in, in the United Russia party, Putin's party, in, among intellectuals. They really see this as a threat. And you may think, it's just a, the spread of freedom. What are they afraid of? They know that, that they, were, they have a kind of a domino theory, sort of like we had in the Vietnam days. But it's, it's a reverse domino, that democracy spreads. They think the United States is propelling it, and the Soros Foundation, and all, all these NGOs, and so on. And they're not wrong to some extent, right? This is partly propelled by uh, Western NGOs and even, even the US government, the um, National Democratic Institute, the International Republican Institute. These, you know, we, we train um, activist groups and, and so on. But he thinks, uh, Putin thinks that this is a geopolitical tool. Democracy promotion is not really about spreading liberty. It's about American power. It's a carrier of American power, as is NATO, as is the European Union. And, and so, I mean, when, when I read how Putin sees the world, this seems, there's this package of things that go together. He doesn't want it at his border, right? So not, exp what I'm saying is not expanding NATO wouldn't really take care of, would not assuage his fears. He'd still be afraid of the spread of democracy. He'd be afraid of the spread of the Euro European Union. Um, and NATO's kind of, a, a, you know, the icing on the, the cake or whatever. The, yeah, that's, Whatever the evil version for him of icing on the cake is, <laughs> um, that, that's so. So I think it's part of the story, but not the whole story. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. But. So, in light of Russia's attack on schools and hospitals and civilian targets, is there, a, even if it's a frozen war, do you see where any any scenario where war crime tribunals occur in light of what happened? Not, not with Russian defendants in at the Hague or, or wherever. I, I, not, not for a long time. I think, I think, um, particularly if this becomes a Cold War, or Russia has a patron, you know, China. Um, Russia is going to more and more opt out of this whole system and just say, come, you know, come and get us. Um, so, so now there, there could and perhaps will be in absentia trials, uh, well deserved, right? But, but I don't, I, I just think that I am seeing more bifurcation in the international system, actually. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Richard McNeil, retired Army, actually a former student of yours back in the late 90s. Oh, yeah, good to see you, right? I love <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. But uh, uh, how concerned are you about the, the level of support that the United States is providing? Um, in, it seems like President Biden right now is trying to draw a very fine line between providing support without becoming a belligerent conflict. Yes. And, but truth be told, um, the amount of support the U.S. has been providing in this conflict is far excessive of what other nations would have done. You know, if we had been in Afghanistan, the, the Russians have been providing high march to the, you know, the Al-Qaeda or Taliban, I think we would have a significant issue with it. I think there's a great legal argument that, you know, because Russia is by far the aggressor here, there's an ability for NATO and the U.S. to provide yeah. uh, support, and there's international court of justice decisions on how much support is such that you become a belligerent. But we've seen Putin take pretext with other issues and make pretext with other issues in order to advance his agenda. At what point do you think that the U.S.'s involvement or what, you know, what could occur that Putin may say you know, the U.S. has become a belligerent that may allow yeah. him to take additional steps maybe against U.S. interests or against NATO interests? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it gets back to this, one of my points, is, is there some point at which the Russians will just say enough, right? We, we, we're going we're gonna to take some action against at least NATO assets and NATO country. Um, but you don't even have to go that far to see, you know, there, there's a, a certain, a point of diminishing returns, at least in theory, to the United States. And I think the Biden people are, are thinking really hard about this. I do think it's a, the point of diminishing returns is probably dynamic, that is, it's moving around. It's further out maybe than it was in March. Um, there's this notion you might, salami tactics, Thomas Schelling's notion that you, instead of slicing off the whole sausage, you take one slice at a time, you can end up with, with the whole sausage, but it was a, is a gradual. So, so that might be part of what's happening. You know, the, as the U.S. extends more support, Russia responds or doesn't respond, then the U.S. Can, can do a bit more. I think that's part of what the Biden people are doing, kind of testing 
see things move that move that frontier a bit. But even so, um, it, it's not an infinite frontier. I, I think, and I don't know where where that is. I, I do think that the Biden people are probably right. If uh, first of all, the no-fly zone idea was just a non-starter. Um, but also providing um, long-range rockets that would enable the Ukrainians easily to hit Russian territory. That that seems to me like a re really a clear boundary. We don't want to don't want to do that. Um, it is hard. Um, I don't have a good handle on how relations between our relations with Ukraine with Zelensky are. They're, they're bound to be testy because he's fighting. Ukraine's fighting for his life, right? They they want as much as we'll give them. So we. The Americans cannot trust the Ukrainians completely. Their promises, oh, give, give us give us the rockets, but, but don't worry, we won't fire them into Russia. You know, put yourself in their position. They might say, look, it's either do this or we lose our country, right? This is also a, a really difficult aspect of the of the relationship that the Biden people have to think. So the Biden people have to hedge a little bit, be, be maybe more careful um, because they don't have perfect information about what the Ukrainians would do, right? So. I can't answer the question except to acknowledge there is a point beyond which it's not in U.S. interest to keep uh, sending stuff. <laughs> and um, I, I'm confident the Biden people are working this problem perpetually, that they're really thinking about this. And it, it's got to be frustrating for everybody. Um, but they're, uh, I, I'm impressed at how they've kept, that they have managed to beef up Ukraine and enable Ukraine to be in the game and even to be doing better than Russia without incurring a direct war with Russia. It's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a trick they're, they're pulling off. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are about <clears throat> the Chinese, uh, not the Chinese, excuse me, the Russian people and how they may be feeling and how that impacts Putin's activities and yeah. or um, how that might change course in any way. Yeah. So it's it's clear that lots of Russians opposed the war at the beginning in February, March. Uh, there were protests, you remember, St. Petersburg, Moscow, in particular the big cities, more metropolitan, kind of Europe-leaning places. Um, a lot of those folks have left, <laughs> right, uh, via Armenia or you know one of the stands, and then gotten just they're gone. Um, I had a in the spring, an old mentor of mine from grad school who had been, had been teaching in Moscow, the higher school of economics for a while, he's an American. Um, he got out and he, he can't go, he can go back, but he doesn't want to. Uh, he, his wife, all their stuff is in their Moscow, all their worldly belongs are in Moscow in their apartment, they don't want to go back. He was teaching uh, at 5 a.m. from my basement in Charlottesville for a while. Um, and he, he told me all these stories about Russians who are leaving and, and they don't know when they're going to go back. And they're all kind of in, in, in some <coughs> there. So a lot of them have left. Others have taken to heart the, you know, the prison sentences that you now incur in Russia for speaking out against the war. And they've just decided it's not worth it. And you know, it's hard to, we can't measure these things, but you hear anecdotes about this. It's just not worth it, right? You can't do anything about it anyway. Um, so. Uh, I think this will only get worse. Russia, according to Western estimates, has lost uh, 68,000 dead in the war. And that's just, this war has not gone on that. That's more than we lost in Vietnam, and this thing has not even been going a year. So it's a, it's a, the rate, the casualty rates is, is devastating. That's bound to have, to be affecting opinion, at least quietly in Russia, right? A lot of families have lost sons, and a lot of wives have lost husbands. And so on. Are there any statistics for the um, Russians who have out migrated? I haven't seen any. Uh, I'm sure someone's trying to get, get those data. I haven't seen them. But the um, one thing that's very clear is that this is partly a, a brain drain from Russia. So it's not helping Russia's future prospects. It's another reason why they're going to be more dependent on China. Russia has a lot of very smart engineers, mathematicians, scientists. Um, and not all, but a lot of them don't want to be there anymore. Right, and, and, and have left, and they've got opportunities in the West, and in Europe or North America, and they're taking them. So, um, yeah. But it's hard to measure dissent. But we we just know there is dissent. It's going to get worse. But it it's quiet. It's, as long as the Russian state is able to put the clamps on, and Putin's very good at that. Right. Um, we won't hear much about it. Yeah. Okay. Why do you think the Russians are so 
what happened to the finances there? The, in the spring, there seemed to be this idea that the economy was cratering, um, and then yeah. everything stabilized. Was that China? But because partly China, partly the rise in oil and gas prices, kind of perversely. Um, the prices have risen as, you know, it's a supply and demand. The supply has gone down, so the price has gone up. And so every um, every barrel of oil or cubic meter of gas is worth more to, to Russia now. So, you know, we, the rest of the world is, is financing Russia's war. Um, the ruble hasn't collapsed. The, you know, the, the banks, um, some, of, some of their banks are shut out from international commerce, but they, um, so so I'll, I'll give you one anecdote I heard this morning on the Zoom call. Um, there's evidence that Turkey is, is um, getting stuff into Russia. Turkey's helping. And it's just not clear what Erdogan or Turkey, what game he's playing. You know, he's maybe trying to have it both ways. But there's some evidence. A lot of money maybe is, is flowing into Russia through Turkey. And the other thing is China. I, again, I don't think China wants to bankroll this war. They don't like the war. They want it to go away. But they also don't want Russia to go under because if Russia go, I didn't mention it. If Russia goes under, like really goes under, uh, that's a that helps the United States. And China thinks its biggest challenge in the world is the United States, our hegemony. And so, they, if it comes down to it, they're going to have to go with Russia. So, uh, you know, there's some suspicion that the, we we try to cut Russia off from high-tech components that they could use to assemble precision-guided munitions, because they have a limited supply of those things. I don't know if that's working. I mean, Ch China can, if they want to, get those components into Russia. I don't think they're doing it. Maybe some of you know better. Um, but in the future, they may they may just do that. Right? But on, on the economy itself, yeah, there were a lot of um, flawed prognostications in the spring. I, I had a colleague saying, yeah, the Russian economy is going to collapse by the fall. Well, the fall is almost over, and it's, it's, uh, it's not. So, um, and it's, it's partly because of ener energy, and other countries need, need Russia, still need Russia, so they're going to help, help Russia. Yeah. Yes? What types of activities are we seeing in the United States that Russian actors are taking to affect our indirect uh, support? Whether it's intelligence espionage, cyber attacks. Yeah, I, I'm not privy to that. I just know the, the Russian playbook would include, including Putin. You know, he's a KGB guy. Um, they've got to be doing some of that, right? I just don't. I just don't. I'm not privy to that. I would be shocked if it weren't extensive, because Russia's in trouble. This is not like 2016 in the election where you know they're doing okay, but they want to monkey around in our politics. They're actually at war, and the war's not going well. So they they really need. So they need to. Bust up the West. That's been Putin's been trying to do that for years. Break up NATO. Turn the Americans and the Europeans against each other. Turn the Europeans against each other. So, you know, Hungary, Hungary, and the Visegrad group, so-called, versus the West Europeans. He's he's trying all of this um, and using every tool he has to do it. But I don't know the particulars. Yeah. Last question. Yes. Uh, dirty bomb. Now we hear. Dirty bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's your opinion whether or not uh, they would do that or that uh, the Ukrainians might do that? Right, so uh, Sergei Shoigu phoned a lot of Western defense ministers last week saying we have intelligence that the Ukrainians are going to use a dirty bomb, which is not a nuclear weapon. It's a conventional bomb that spreads radiation. So um, I can't, and, and so rather than keep this secret, all the, you know, um, Lloyd Austin and everybody's saying, well, this is a false flag. They're, this is going to be a false If it happens, it's a false flag operation, which I think is exactly the right way to play it. I have trouble thinking why Ukraine would, would do this. I mean, what, what, what would be their next? But what, what would Russia then do? And then what would Ukraine do? Does Ukraine want to escalate the war? Well, they want to get Russia out, but you know, they're doing what they can to do that already. So that, that they're, they're making the moves they can make, it seems to me. Um, unless it would, I mean, can Ukraine attack Russian territory in a big way? I, I don't see it. And again, maybe some of you know more than I do about that. So, I, but I can see why Russia would do a false flag operation. Yeah, because yeah, they're looking for excuses to, not necessarily to fire a nuclear weapon themselves, but to escalate and to get really, to, you know, to, in, insofar as there are any kid gloves, 
uh, take those off. Um, and yeah, so I, I I'm, and we'll we'll see what happens. I certainly hope it doesn't happen um, at this point. I hope I hope as in the run up to the war, or Western intel kind of outplayed the Russians. I hope that's happened again in this case, but we shall see. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you.